working with the Model T Ford factories in America, he said that um, individualize well um, uh, skills, giving everyone a different skill yeah. would benefit everyone. Whereas in reality, it was very low wages and people were very harshly treated. Yeah, well, that is a, a common critique of Adam Smith and uh, and his view is that people end up. Um, having a, um, a very alienated uh, existence. It's a, it's a word we use in connection with Rousseau previously. It comes back with uh, Hegel and Marx. That uh, in his famous example of the pin factory, it, the pins that are produced might not be very cheap because they, they might have been previously made in a kind of cottage industry, but the whole family could make a few pins and then go for a walk and, and, and they had kind of satisfaction that I make really good pins. Um, but now they're an atomized person on a production line, and their job is just to measure the point of the pin or something. And it's very boring, it's very repetitive, it's very soul-destroying. Um, and he was aware of that. Uh, and, uh, but he said, well, you know, that's life. You know, it's, it's like cursing the law of gravity. If you try and stop division of labor, all you will produce is misery in a kind of different form. So in that sense, he, he's a rather pessimistic f thinker. Generally speaking, he's optimistic, though, because he, he thinks that, well, then people will jack it in in the pin, pin factory. They won't do it. They'll go off and, and do something uh, more fulfilling. Um, so, yeah, that's a common critique of it, and the kind of harshness of the factory system that we saw in the 19th century that was built up uh, explicitly on the principles of free trade Adam Smith is a very important thinker in framing actual government policy in terms of repeal of the Corn Laws and the promotion of free trade. It did create a kind of hell on earth, <clears throat> really, for 100 years in the industrial towns of, of, of England, the north of England, and, and throughout the world. Um, and, of course, still today, I mean, you know, jobs are broken down to the point where somebody uh, in, in the food production line has absolutely no idea where this stuff has come from or where it's going. They just do this thing and they're bored out of their mind. They are low paid. Uh, it's de-skilled. They can easily be replaced. So um, it, it's a good point, and he's, he's kind of um, in two minds about it, I would say. Um, he's a very controversial figure. I mean, he's, he moves in and out of fashion um, over time. Uh, currently, how, how does he stand? He's in the doghouse at the moment. He was unbelievable. First of all, he was very unfashionable in the 1930s. So Bertrand Russell, for example, in his book, doesn't even mention him. I was amazed to find not one line about uh, Adam Smith. Why? Because the, the 20s and 30s was the era of mass unemployment. Now, one of the consequences of the hidden hand of the market uh, and of what's called classical economics generally is that unemployment is impossible. It's an, it, it's an affront to nature, like levitation or hovering. You know, it's against the law of gravity. You could have temporary unemployment as people move out of the pin factory because nobody wants pins anymore into whatever it is doing next. But the idea of long-term permanent unemployment, Smith thinks, is either impossible or it's caused by government intervention on a massive scale. So he had no. So the whole system was discredited by mass unemployment of the 30s, because the unemployment wasn't just in England, it was in North America, it was throughout the world. So the idea, if you were an unemployed shipbuilder in Glasgow, you simply get on your bike, in the, in the phrase later of, of Norman Tebbit, and go to China or North Korea or Mongolia or something, get a job there, simply made no sense, because they also had mass unemployment. So he was very unfashionable then. Uh, but then, with what was seen as the relative failure of socialism of one sort or another, uh, in the 60s, 70s, uh, and 80s, he became very fashionable uh, with uh, the neoconservative movement, as it's called in the United States, and the Thatcherite movement, as it was known in Britain. So, as the socialists had had Karl Marx and other types of uh, philosophers, they, they'd kind of found their Karl Marx in a way, the, the kind of a guy from the olden days, the philosopher, who had a complete kind of system that they could embrace. So, the adoption of the free trade concept, the hidden hand of the market, you can't buck the market, was one famous phrase of Margaret Thatcher. It's no good giving people a minimum wage or subsidies or import tariffs to protect jobs. It won't work. It, all it will do is create poverty of the type that was seen in Poland or Eastern, Eastern Europe, where the, the economy was um, 
uh, state control. And also there would be no freedom. There would also be no freedom because these economic restrictions would inevitably impinge on things like free speech and free movement and everything. So as the kind of anti-communist movement of the 80s, Adam Smith was a big, big ticket. But then... Uh, he's out of favour again now because he's being largely blamed. All that deregulation and denationalisation and breaking trade unions and deregulation of financial markets, he's being blamed for that again. And forms of government regulation are, and government intervention in the economy are once again in fashion. So he's kind of out at the moment. He's also out intellectually uh, for, for a different reason, which we could perhaps uh, discuss. Um, I just want to bring in Andrew at this point. He's very keen to... Um, well, I think what's particularly um, interesting about um, about Smith is the fact that um, in, in a time where not too far previously um, morality took took a big um, you know was, was a big consideration in in the putting forward of any kind of um, new new ideas or theories, and that Smith completely expelled that. And I also think that that's what um, I don't want to get I know we don't want to get too much onto it, but but what. Um, Swift was satirising in part in saying that, well, yes, that works, but so does the idea of eating your own children. That works as well, but if you take morality out of it completely, but in, in real life, does it really make sense? So I think that a lot of what um, Smith does make, says, does make sense. Um, but my, my issue with it, in, in, which is my issue with so much,